Since the beginning of recorded history, the human race has been at war. First with members of their own family, then their fellow countrymen, and finally nations at large. Yet perhaps the starting ground for all these conflicts lay somewhere deeper within the very character of the human condition, in the dark, untouchable crevices of the human heart. It is said that the first iniquity of free will began even before the maiden pilgrimage from the embryo, preceding the very creation of the earth itself, in the forelife of souls in the heavenly realms. The dawn of warfare, some believe, was initiated by a fallen angel, whose trespass against God was pride. In ancient Babylonia, in an age so long ago that the exact millennium remains in question, the Tower of Babel began construction. It was to be the single greatest achievement of the human race. A tower so tall that its summit would reach the heavens and by it prove to the world that their race was superior. It would be God's irony that it would never be finished. Time passed, nations fell, a machine age emerged. And once again, the ingenuity of the species, which held dominion over all others, unveiled what was at the time the most monumental accomplishment ever imagined. The largest machine yet constructed. An automation so mammoth and so revered, even before its first demonstration, that its only befitting name was Titanic. On April 10th, 1912, it set sail. It was boasted to be the ship that God himself could not sink. It would be God's irony that the very element that was meant to keep it afloat would cause it to sink. Water, frozen water, in the form of an iceberg. Not even one voyage did it complete. And then the next age embarked into the annals of human history. Perhaps the last age. The space age. Competition for Victor was unparalleled. Powerful nations spent billions in unabashed rivalry to outdo the other. The Soviet Union launched the first orbiting satellite, the first animal, the first man. They had logged 500% more hours in space than the United States. And in June of 1969, they launched an unmanned probe to the moon to retrieve the first soil sample from another world just one month before Apollo 11. That's how close the race was. Had their unmanned probe not crash-landed into the lunar surface, the first moon rock brought back to Earth would have been by the Soviet Union. Richard Nixon, president at the time, had this to say about the latest work of the human hand. It is the greatest week since creation. The greatest event since the laying of the foundation of the seas. Since the origin of the universe itself. Since the design and formation of the delicate human eye through which all these things are perceived, was a flying machine with its two passengers landing on its closest celestial neighbor and returning from where it came. Perhaps again, God's irony lies somewhere within this great boast of humankind. The building of the tallest tower for the sole purpose of standing out among the races was never finished. The machine that was so great that it was said to be untouchable by even God never completed its first voyage. And finally, the crowning achievement of humankind, the greatest boast of the species, the event in human history most associated with pride in our own accomplishments, landing on the moon. Twenty years later, and years behind schedule, the same space program couldn't put into Earth orbit a telescope with a lens that focused. And yet two decades earlier, a mission 100 times more complicated worked on its first occasion. With close scrutiny of the motives of the zealous Nixon administration, a critical examination of the entirely government-controlled press coverage, and newly discovered footage of the crew of Apollo 11 staging part of their mission, we wish to detail what may come to be the greatest government conspiracy of all time. A funny thing happened on the way to the moon. I'm convinced that in the space field, the Russians are ahead of us, particularly in uh, large weightlifting capability, 
And uh, that at the moment, the problem is not so much to catch up, but first build up the working speed that they have already demonstrated. After we are running as fast as they do, there's still a considerable gap to close, and only uh, the future will tell whether we'll manage to close that gap. We cannot and will not ever get into this race as we should, so long as all of our objectives are short-term objectives. We've got to have no finite end to our objectives. The end of our objectives should be as far as we can see at any given time. But right now, we need a 10 to 12 year program that has as its ultimate goal the man domination of space. And if we don't, we're going to be in trouble. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. We must assure our preeminence in the peaceful exploration of outer space, focusing on an expedition to the moon in this decade. T-minus 60 seconds and counting. We pass T-minus 60. 55 seconds and counting. Neil Armstrong reported back when he received the good wishes. Thank you very much. We know it will be a good flight. Good luck and Godspeed. 40 seconds away from the Apollo 11 liftoff. All the second stage tanks now pressurized. 35 seconds and counting. We are still go with Apollo 11. 30 seconds and counting. Astronauts...
war riddled with contradiction and ambiguity. In addition, the Apollo program had already spent billions of dollars. If it failed to achieve its goal with such an investment, it would indeed be a large and bitter pill for the taxpayers to swallow. The cost of the program, whose sole goal was to be the first to plant a flag on the lifeless rock just outside the Earth, if adjusted for inflation to the 21st century, was $135 billion. With a profit margin of just 7%, this would be equal to over $9 billion profit going to the privileged contractors chosen by their friends at NASA. If the machinery was in fact only achieving Earth orbit, as other earlier missions had already done,
Lunar Module's 10,000 pound thrust engine, despite the fact that during ground tests there was a real concern for the vehicle falling into the hole the engine created as it descended. Here is a Norman Rockwell depiction drawn just two years earlier based on the latest specifications and scientific data. In these enlargements, it looks as though the lunar module was simply placed there, not even one speck of moon dust on the landing pod. As a result, all subsequent flights had to have the same discrepancy, which was explained away by the effect of no atmosphere. And what about stars? On the moon, with no atmosphere, they must have been quite a sight to behold. Yet there is seldom any mention of them, if ever, by any of the astronauts on any of the missions. Undoubtedly, creating a mural with all the constellations properly placed in the sky would have been virtually impossible to create accurately, much less realistically. A competent amateur astronomer would have been able to call attention to the slightest error in measurement. The answer? not to talk about the stars, ever. In their post-flight press conference, it was the only question to which Neil Armstrong responded with an absence of memory. When you looked up at the sky, could you actually see the stars and the solar corona in spite of the glare? We were never able to see stars from the lunar surface or on the daylight side of the moon by eye without looking through the optics. Uh, I don't recall during the period of time that we were photographing the Sona Corolla what, what stars we could see. I don't remember seeing any. Years later, though, Michael Collins would remember seeing the elusive stars and wrote about them in Expeditions to the Moon. It seems his memory improved the older he got. Why don't stars appear in any of the photographs? simply because the proper, mostly closed exposure setting for the camera's iris set that way to compensate for the bright sunlight on the moon's surface completely diminished the faintness of relatively distant specks of diminutive light. This answer is true. It does not, however, explain why they never took any pictures of the stars by themselves with an exposure setting perfect for them. While they took three automobiles to the moon, they never took a photographic telescope. Had they done so, they would have been able to see farther into the universe than had ever before been realized. If they had taken a telescope and were not actually on the moon, they would have had to concoct undiscovered galaxies that might one day prove to be non-existent. The cost of the three moon rovers in 21st century currency? Nearly 60 million dollars each though they had fewer parts than a jeep. Where was all this money going? Then there's the flag, blowing in the wind, at least twice, on the atmosphereless moon. We can only guess that most of the missions were staged inside for fear of possible aerial or satellite reconnaissance from an unfriendly nation. The backpacks, designed for one-sixth gravity, must have had the cooling systems removed to allow for movement without falling over. With very near and hot studio lighting, that left one hot astronaut inside. Assuming that it was the astronauts inside, after all, their faces were always covered. The necessary mammoth amounts of air conditioning were probably responsible for the air current. Here the editor cuts to a still shot of the flag, just as the effect becomes noticeable. Here it is unchecked. This rare clip, attained decades ago, was never re-released with the inevitable increase in experience and scrutiny. To demonstrate one-sixth gravity, a bouncy, floaty feel to the astronauts' movements would be similarly achieved with relative simplicity. Slow motion. You are viewing the scenes as they aired more than 30 years ago. Now let's look at them with the speed doubled. It becomes discernible that they are, in fact, in Earth's gravity and are no more leaving the ground than they would on Earth. It is clear from these rarely seen color television pictures that the crew of Apollo 11 brought a high-resolution color video camera with them on their mission. Yet the only pictures broadcast live from the moon's surface were these from a low-definition black-and-white camera. 
In fact, the networks complained because in addition to this, they were forced to shoot the images second generation off of a projection TV of the technology of 30 years ago and were not even allowed to take a direct feed, which further degraded the quality and clarity of the images. Perhaps this was precisely what NASA and the federal government had in mind. After all, it was a first, regardless of where they were. Better to open up their debut mission with fuzzy pictures and numerous blackouts, rather than show too much revealing detail of a false scene that was yet unproven. And finally, the element that seals their fate. Of all the footage of Apollo 11 requested from NASA over a five-year period, one gem was discovered just before the completion of this documentary. An old reel received by mistake. It contains the raw or unedited footage of the crew of Apollo 11, Michael Collins, Edwin Aldrin Jr. and Neil Armstrong, staging part of their mission for nearly an hour in living color with exceptionally clear behind-the-scenes audio of conversations discussing the techniques used to achieve a disingenuous picture depicting the Earth at a distance in order to falsely demonstrate their far journey from it and their ability to survive passing through the Van Allen radiation belts. It cannot be misconstrued that this staging was done for some other reason prior to the mission, for the reel itself is slated and dated July 18th, 19th, and 20th, 1969, the very days of the mission when they were said to be approaching and achieving lunar orbit. Furthermore, it is apparent they are in genuine zero gravity aboard the actual spacecraft, necessary to convince the mass media of their authenticity, just not any further than Earth orbit, as you will see. In this never-before-seen or heard footage, not only is the radio conversation between the astronauts and Houston Control audible, there is a secondary, private conversation taking place between the crew and a third confidential party, prompting the astronauts with what to say, when to speak, and how to effectively manipulate the camera to achieve the desired misleading effect. NASA claims that the Houston transmissions were the only ones taking place with the astronauts. Listen now as Houston Control initiates a conversation with the crew, only to find them too preoccupied with the behind-the-scenes trickery to respond. Moments pass and the oversight is picked up on by the clandestine third party who quickly prompts them with talk. Immediately, Neil Armstrong speaks. Here they discuss the fact that they have turned out the lights and have blocked out sunlight from entering the spacecraft through the other windows as to not cause any reflected light to fall onto the spacecraft's wall in the foreground. Okay, very good. Well, we shut out the sun coming in some of the other windows under the spacecraft, so uh, it's looking through a, uh, the uh, number one window and there isn't any uh, reflected light. The reason this was done is so that the truth of the matter would not be revealed. It is this. Though the federal government would have you believe that this is a view of Earth from a distance out of the spacecraft's window as it nears the moon, it is not. What they have ingeniously done is placed the camera at the back of the spacecraft and centered the lens on a circular window in the foreground, outside of which it is completely filled with the Earth in low orbit. 
the circumference of the window then appears to be the diameter of the Earth at a distance, with the darkened walls of the spacecraft appearing to be the blackness of space around it. That is why they wanted the interior dark and blocked out the sun from entering through the other windows. Here you can see the extruded window, probably two inches thick at the bottom. This is because the Earth's shine is coming in at a downward angle. It also causes the Earth to appear to be an irregularly shaped circle, for you are seeing the outside of the window at the bottom and the inside of the window at the top, which together form two different sized halves of a circle. Subsequently, this take was never used. As they perfected the shot, a crescent-shaped piece of black material was inset slightly into the window to create the illusion of the Earth's terminator line dividing night and day. It is uncannily convincing. During this segment, intended to be edited and played back later for the worldwide television audience, dated July 18, 1969, Neil Armstrong condemns himself as he states that he is 130,000 miles out or halfway to the moon, as the NASA flight log also states on this date, when he is in reality in low Earth orbit of a few hundred miles. Roger, Houston, Apollo 11. Calling in from about 130,000 miles out. Here, during another segment, also intended to air after review, Neil Armstrong falsely explains to the viewers how the shot is attained by putting the camera's lens to the window's glass, as it would have to be if they were the claimed distance away from the Earth. We only have one uh, window that uh, has a view of the Earth, and it's filled up with a TV camera. If the window was completely filled up with a TV camera, as he stated, then an astronaut's arm would not be able to get between the camera and the window, as it obviously does here in this outtake. South America becomes invisible just off beyond the Terminator or inside the shadow. You can also notice how the astronaut operating the camera reacted to the mistake by attempting to pan away from it. The white bands of major cloud formations across the Earth. This is a segment that they believed wasn't even being recorded, much less suitable for broadcast, for the lens was being zoomed out and the scene was being changed to that of an interior of the astronauts at work and apparently the stop button popped back up on the recorder without notice. Here is the diffused work light that they used to see camera controls but not throw light onto the spacecraft's wall. Here they remove part of the crescent insert Finally, the iris is opened up and you can see the real location of the camera and the very bright and near Earth out the window. Here is the slate for the 19th of July and the same shot of trickery on the 19th of July. And then the 20th and the same misleading shot on the 20th. Later that evening, they were said to be walking on the moon. How can this be when they were in Earth orbit only nine hours earlier and the moon is some three days journey away? Furthermore, if they genuinely went to the moon, why would they be faking any part of it? Why this trickery with the window? By faking being halfway to the moon, it becomes apparent that they did so because they could not even go halfway. It thus confirms that the stumbling block to their success was the lethal radiation of the Van Allen radiation belts. Since the same equipment was used on the subsequent missions in the 40 months that followed, none of them could have gone to the moon. They only increased their proficiency at staging them. When some TV viewers of the second manned mission to the moon telephoned the networks complaining that reruns of I Love Lucy were being interrupted, it became clear that for the taxpayers, once was enough. But it wasn't enough for the government and contractors. Billions of dollars of pure profit went with each return. How coincidental that the following mission would have the element of life and death jeopardy. Apollo 13.
Now the public would take going to the moon more seriously and be reconnected with the drama. We now realize that perhaps the reason Neil Armstrong has never given an on-camera interview is because he doesn't want to lie anymore. What threats may have been made upon such honorable men or their families to possess their reluctant cooperation and later ill feelings towards perpetuating this still darkened hour in American history. NASA's highest ranking official, James Webb, resigned without explanation just days before the first Apollo mission. Why, when he was on the threshold of achieving the greatest accomplishment of his career? All three Apollo breakthroughs available to those who can remove one of truth's protective layers. He is that layer. Perhaps someday soon, with the uncovering of this footage and its meaning, the true patriots of America will rise up or come forward and free the citizens and themselves from the sin that so easily entangles and from a federal government that needs to have the gangrene cut off. Even if the government's destruction would come from the truth, then it is not worthy to stand, and its betterment would inevitably follow. All of us are mortal. All of us will die. Perhaps the seeking of a clear conscience before that hour will motivate the truth into the light. Perhaps as citizens we should offer amnesty for this and other crimes of history for facts from those involved before the truth perishes with them. Why must we wait until the year 2017 to open the Kennedy assassination files? Perhaps they will not even be opened then, for the law that reluctantly stipulates their release says so with this clause. Quote, with the exception of documents certified for continued postponement by the President. Whoever believes the citizens to be too immature for the truth are too immature for power. The truth will always set us free. <laughs>